Hello, I'm John Walkup, and it's my pleasure to be speaking with you today. I'm going to be talking about um, really a career journey that really started with clinical trials and has moved on to population health with a focus on closing the mental health gap and meeting the needs of kids and families. I am so appreciative to the Ruane family and the Brain and Behavior Research Foundation for uh, recognizing uh, my small contribution to the field. And uh, I really appreciate uh, this opportunity to talk with you about the work that I've done over the course of my career and hopefully um, inspire others to engage in research in child and adolescent psychiatry. I only have a couple of disclosures that I think are meaningful, and that is that I get royalties from um, books on Tourette syndrome and an up-to-date um, on anxiety disorders, and I have received honoraria from the American Academy of Child and Adolescent Psychiatry and the American Academy of Pediatrics. So this talk is more of an homage to uh, people that I've worked with than, than a scientific talk per se. And it's more about taking scientific opportunities than having a singular passion over the course of my career. It's more about working in teams, if you will, than individual effort. And hopefully it's a lot about where we need to go in terms of clinical research. I really want to thank uh, people who got me started. And, and I think about Dennis Charney and George Henninger at Yale, uh, who first introduced me to Jim Lechman and Donald Cohen. And once I got into the Yale Child Study Center, I got a chance to meet Mark Riddle. And then after leaving Yale, I went to uh, Hopkins, where I worked with Harvey Singer and Susan Folstein. And over the course of my career, I've had a great relationship with the Tread Association of America. And uh, towards the end of my career, I've had a really nice relationship with a variety of psychologists from the Tread Association Behavioral Sciences Consortium. The first real paper that um, occurred when I was actually in training was a family study of, of Tourette uh, by David Paulson and Jim Lechman that suggested there was an autosomal dominant transmission of Tourette simply because we kept seeing parents and kids uh, not skipping a generation, if you will, with Tourette syndrome within that clinical context. When I went to Hopkins, um, met Harvey Singer, we had some questions about that study and so decided to do a replication. And this is really the first study that suggested that Tourette was a much more complicated uh, genetic uh, disorder, not simply an autosomal dominant condition. Um, approximately 20, 25 years later, uh, we published the first real behavioral treatment trial for kids with Tourette syndrome which I think essentially changed the characterization of Tourette syndrome from a neuropsychiatric disorder to a neuropsychiatric and behavioral disorder. A genetic condition, clearly neurological, with psychiatric comorbidity, but with very strong uh, influences on the environmental side. We've also um, had a chance to do a variety of subsequent papers in this population. We've done long-term follow-up, which suggests that this behavioral treatment is durable. And we've also disseminated the treatment to adults up to age 65, to children under age of nine. And really, we've increased the workforce, if you will, because of this intervention, a workforce of those who can take care of patients with Tourette to include psychology now, nurses and occupational therapists. My career really shifted when Mark Riddle came to Hopkins and we began to move, um, taking advantage, if you will, of a really ripe uh, clinical trials environment um, in the late 90s and early 2000s. And um, got to meet Danny Pine at that time, who was at Columbia, um, also began to work with John March and David Brent and, and Barbara Geller, um, all of whom were engaged in clinical trials, really trying to establish the evidence base for the basic psychiatric disorders in children. A lot of this effort was really spearheaded by Peter Jensen and Ben Vitiello at the National Institutes of Mental Health. And they really set the stage, if you will, for our current evidence base. So, Probably the first big clinical trial in which I was involved was using fluvoxamine 
for children and adolescents with obsessive compulsive disorder. Uh, this was an industry funded trial and, and demonstrated that fluvoxamine was effective for this condition. Based on that work and others, uh, we applied for and became a research unit of pediatric psychopharm. And because of our relationship and use of fluvoxamine, this was really the first large scale clinical trial focusing on separation, social and generalized anxiety disorder in kids and demonstrated in a pretty substantial way with a large effect size the value of SSRI treatment to reduce uh, both uh, symptoms, but also functional impairment in kids with anxiety disorders. The RUP got very engaged in doing lots and lots of different studies, one of which included the treatment of adolescent suicide attempters study that was really led by David Brent and a variety of folks um, in, uh, at Pittsburgh, at Columbia, and, um, and at Johns Hopkins at that time. This study actually demonstrated that you could re reduce the rates of reattempt in kids who were clinically depressed as well as, um, as uh, at risk for suicidal behavior. At this time, there was a whole number of industry or NIMH funded trials that occurred. The treatment of adolescent depression study, which was run by uh, John March and the folks at Duke, the treatment of resistant depression in adolescents, which uh, David Branton uh, led from Pittsburgh. Barbara Geller did the treatment of early age mania study and the preschool treatment of ADHD, um, uh, preschool treatment of ADHD study. Uh, the PATH study was uh, done by Columbia and, um, and Johns Hopkins. And out of this work really came the opportunity to build on the early RUP work on uh, anxiety disorders, and we received funding for the Child Adolescent Anxiety Multimodal Study. This study, which is published in the New England Journal, essentially set the evidence base for the treatment of anxiety disorders to kids and adolescents. And the results suggest that um, combination treatment far uh, outpaced, if you will, the uh, value of CBT and sertraline, as well as placebo in this study. And I think um, relative to the field at large, over 70 papers have been published from this study and its long-term follow-up, um, suggesting the value really of NIH investment in um, clinical trials in the childhood psychiatric disorders. At the same time, I was deeply engaged in clinical trials work. I had the opportunity to work with folks at the Johns Hopkins Center for American Indian Health. There, I, I worked with Allison Barlow, who's the current director, Matu Santosham, who's the director emeritus, Novalin Goklish and Francine Larzelier um, are two uh, American Indian collaborators from the White Mountain Apache tribe, and Mary Swick, who I had a chance to work with at Hopkins and worked with on the TASA study also joined the center and we began to work collaboratively with native communities in the Southwest. Um, early in, in our experience, Allison and I wrote a couple of papers essentially describing the value of thinking about working in native communities and, and developing mental health services where there really were little or no resources available. And really importantly from that, that that work had so much to tell us about population health and a public health approach to reducing mental health disparities. The first project that we really worked on was an intervention called the Family Spirit Intervention. This was a home, interven home visiting intervention for pregnant teens that worked with uh, teens from pregnancy through three years of age and essentially demonstrated that um, you could not only train moms to do a really good job at caring for their infants, but that that uh, intervention also improved babies' abilities to self-regulate, reduce their internalizing distress, as well as their kind of fussiness, if you will. There were three trials um, over a period of time, recruiting about, um, I think about 500 moms total, and the important thing, I think, from this intervention was that it is now in over 150 tribal communities uh, around the country. And I think one of the important things that I've learned from, from this work 
is that there are some interventions that are very difficult to disseminate. But when you really work at, within communities with populations that have a need and you use local resources and you develop this community-based participatory research and have local collaborators, essentially what you do is you set up an opportunity for what I describe as explosive dissemination. So if you look at this map, um, many of these uh, states in, in uh, teal color, I guess you'd call it, um, are places where there are large American Indian populations and um, have at this point adopted and implemented and sustained the family spirit intervention within their communities. In addition to this work, we've also been deeply involved in suicides uh, prevention within Native communities. This has mostly been focused on the White Mountain Apache Reservation. And the White Mountain Apaches have had periods of time where they've had spikes in suicide rate. I first had got involved with the White Mountain Apache in 1993 after one such spike. And then in 2001, after another spike, the tribe decided that it was going to develop a surveillance system uh, for suicide within the community. Part and parcel of that suicide surveillance system was a mandated reporting requirement. And that is that any person who had suicidal behavior um, that became known to anyone within the community was referred to the Suicide Prevention Task Force. And the task force followed up with them, did an assessment, and then uh, worked to refer them to appropriate services. The one cool thing about this was that it was absolutely mandated. And while I think it would be very difficult to have such mandated reporting in any place in the, in the world, the White Mountain Apache decided that their lives of their community members were so important that that privacy or confidentiality issue that might impact others was something that they would put aside for the value of saving lives within their community. It was a heroic effort to kind of really focus on reducing suicide. Um, this work over a 12 year period actually demonstrated a reduction in suicide rates from approximately 40 per 100,000 to a little over 20 per 100,000 within a decade and during which the surveillance system was in place. This was at a time when suicide rates nationally were climbing. And so I think the White Mountain Apache have really done an outstanding job using their surveillance system in a public health approach to reduce suicide within their community. So I think it's so important as child psychiatrists, we tend to get trained to see individual kids and families and to work in a clinic type model. But you know, that model of care is just not going to work given the fact that 20% of kids have a mental health problem before they graduate from high school less than half nationally get any kind of evaluation or treatment. And more recently, literature actually suggests that less than half of those who actually get treatment have clinically meaningful benefit. So if you think about it, that's about 15% of our population who either don't get treated or get treated but don't benefit. And those youngsters are probably the ones who are peaking during COVID-19 and it's a large population of, of young people who really at this point are presenting for care. So I think it's also important to note that much of the mental health burden is preventable at the level of family and community. So things like suicide, substance abuse risk, poor educational attainment, um, conduct problems, all of which we know are problems that really have their origins within family and community and we have interventions that can prevent or disrupt um, those, those problems uh, by early intervention. So uh, taking this to scale, I think it's important uh, to know that we haven't stopped studying anxiety. A uh, recently funded um, trial from PCORI called the Partners in Care for Anxious Youth. It's a collaboration of of uh, myself at Lurie Children's with Jeff Strawn at University of Cincinnati and Tara Paris and John Pasantini at UCLA. Um, this is a study of kids seven to 17 years of age with the anxiety disorders. 
And what's interesting about this trial is these kids are identified and treated within the community context, a true effectiveness study, if you will. Pediatricians screen, identify these kids, and then the kids are randomized to either uh, cognitive behavioral therapy alone or cognitive behavioral therapy plus meds. The therapists are community-based therapists largely in this study. And so you're going to get a real estimate of what it looks like um, for our evidence-based treatments to be implemented within um, the community setting. One of the reasons why we wanted to do this study and PCORI thought it was valuable is that we know that the maximum benefit of our treatments really occurs around 24 weeks and that remission rates actually favor combined treatment over CBT, which is really the parent's treatment of choice. But parents usually don't know when they pick CBT that they substantively disadvantage themselves from an opportunity to get to remission. At week 12, the remission rate for combined treatment was 65%. The remission rate for CBT was 35%. We also know from long-term follow-up that those kids who remitted early have the very best outcomes. Kids who remitted later or never remitted have a more troublesome and tumultuous course. So I think it's important, and, and Picori agreed with us, that informing parents about what the value of combined treatment, that is adding medicine right from the beginning, the value of that in terms of getting to remission quickly and effectively and putting their child at the best opportunity for a long-term outcome. We've also been very fortunate recently to take what we've learned from American Indian communities, develop partnerships in the, in the community um, here in Chicago, and um, applied for the Kellogg Racial Equity 2030 Challenge Grant. Um, Kellogg really advertised this as looking for protocols and strategies solutions, if you will, for transformative change in systems and institutions that uphold racial inequities. Essentially, trying to work within communities where that needed to heal from histories of racism. There were 1,500 applications worldwide. There were 10 finalists, uh, which each got a million dollars to do their planning grant over the first year. We were one of those uh, uh, awardees. And at this time, we're putting together our proposal, uh, developing uh, further our collaborations, because in the end, we'll have an opportunity to go for uh, $20 million uh, for, that should be millions, uh, for three awards and $10 million awards, uh, two $10 million awards. Our project is called Healing Through Justice, a community-led breakthrough strategy for healing-centered communities in Illinois. This is a collaboration of Communities United and Lurie Children's Hospital of Chicago. And what we plan to bring to scale is a strategy that Communities United has been uh, collaborating, has been doing in Chicago and working with Lurie Children's for about a decade. It's a youth-led movement for healing that will make breakthroughs in supporting and sustaining community-led approaches to healing-centered communities. Specifically, what this project takes advantage of is uh, an understanding that recovery is the natural outcome of trauma. And our experience uh, and knowing about trauma in psychiatry, there are really three uh, stages, if you will, that are quite predictable in the sequence. And that is initially people are devastated by the trauma. People begin then to put their life together again and what we're increasingly seeing and focusing on is really a, a post-traumatic growth or transcendent period of time where people, once their lives are coming together, they begin to realize their dreams, they begin to think about where they've been, and they begin to mobilize their personal resources because of the trauma to do something transcendent for themselves and for their community. Uh, the leads at Communities United are uh, Jenny Awadi, Raul Batello, and Mar Maria De Hilo. And um, they wrote in this proposal that youth leaders 
describe a deep process of personal recovery when they actively address the root causes of racial inequities within their community. The youth believe that community healing will occur when youth leaders motivated by their own lived experience draw broad-based community action to address racial inequity. Um, this maps on so well with what we know about healing from trauma and it is the lived experience of kids within uh, the city of Chicago and Kellogg and the reviewers agreed with us that this was a, a breakthrough strategy to really transform communities. Uh, lastly, I would just like to thank um, the chairs that I've worked with over time at Hopkins. Uh, Joe Coyle hired me. Uh, Susan Folstein helped me write my first grant. And Mark Riddle and I worked together uh, for about a decade uh, developing and implementing clinical trials. I went to Cornell where I have had an ongoing and, and terrific relationship with Jack Barkas. And when I came here to Lurie Children's, uh, I worked very closely with John Chernansky, who I, I knew for about 20 years through our work with Tourette syndrome. So um, my great thank you for their support of my career development and, uh, and ongoing interest. So in summary, we have a very strong evidence base in child and adolescent psychiatry, and we are really on the edge of uh, integrated care movement, basing uh, our psychiatry, if you will, in primary care. And it, from my point of view, is the new clinical trials platform. We still do clinical trials within the psychiatry clinic, but if we really are going to learn how our treatments work in the real world, we really need to be thinking about doing our clinical trials within that uh, collaborative care context. Also, our, our treatments aren't going to be very good if they really don't um, have applicability to all the children that we tend to see. And so community-based participatory research is going to guarantee that our interventions will meet the needs of all children and families. Thank you much, very much for listening today. Thank you again to the Ruane family and the Brain and Behavior uh, Research Foundation. I really appreciate the recognition of this work.